thank you everyone. I hope you can hear me. Um, so first, first of all, um, thank you for having me today uh, in this amazing panel of trans specialists. So it's, uh, I'm really delighted. Um, sorry to be you know, at such a distance, uh, but there will be a time in which I will be present, I promised. And thank you, BBK, thank you, C4E, and all the amazing organizers, uh, superb organization. So um, first of all, I, I know you you like had a different title listed in the program, so I, I'm, I'm sorry about that. I, I changed it like uh, at the very last moment, but I thought that I had like to put what I wanted to say, which is still there, so it, no, don't worry, it's, it's the same talk, but... Uh, for, uh, we, I needed to have like a, a larger context for the things that I, I'm, I'm going to talk about. Um, so, and, and this, this, this is urgent in, in a sense that you, I think, we learn as we as we progress. So, my, what is my agenda for for the next 20 minutes or so? Uh, it might be less, might be a bit more. Hopefully, less. And and it's as follows. First of all, I will say really a few words about me and about the company. Uh, I help uh, help found uh, a few years ago, but uh, given that you know that there was such a great introduction, I will spend less time uh, there. I will then introduce an analogy with uh, a much discussed uh, buzzword in the realm of sustainability. Uh, you, you can see them there. Uh, it's, uh, it's um, you know biodiversity and regeneration. But I wanted them to be applied in a different uh, area. So it's an unexpected, let's say, uh, application, which is the creative digital space. So this is what, uh, um, what I'm going to um, basically uh, explain. So but, and if you will bear with me, um, we will discover that there are real world implications that are more than metaphorical when we speak about what you can see there, the biodiversity of uh, creativity. And, and in discussing this analogy, I will showcase some of the AI that often is you know, thought of as a problem in terms of you know, stifling creativity and, and you know, being what uh, you know, brings uh, homogeneity in, in our world. Um, but AI can be indeed part of the solution. This is what I want to um, explain and, and showcase. If, of course, if it, this kind of technology is designed with its purpose in mind. So um, finally, I will actually uh, uh, get into uh, a different scenario. So uh, all this uh, you know, discourse will bring us uh, to consider an unprecedented uh, change in how we conceptualize uh, scarcity, or what I, uh, as I like it to define, rarity and abundance in the creative digital space. So this is a, these are the main concepts you will see through the presentation. Uh, but let's get started. So this is me. So I hold a PhD in philosophy. So I, I'm, I'm no engineer here, but uh, I, I actually specialize in a very abstract uh, field of philosophy, which is called ontology. Uh, but, but then, of course, my interest shifted a bit into the philosophy of technology and AI, by the way, most of the things that uh, te technologists are doing behind the scenes when they are doing AI is, has, has been already said by Aristotle. So <laughs> this is something to be kept in mind. Um, and I, uh, after my um, academic career, which was actually ended by the idea of doing a project, an entrepreneurial project in the digital space, um, I, I founded the company with my brother, which is called iCool Hunt, but then renamed into Nextatlas, which is our main product. And Nextatlas uh, has been pioneering since a few years um, in a novel approach to trend forecasting. So we saw a number of uh, uh, you know, um, super talented trend specialists uh, in, this, in, this, in this conference. But what, what we wanted to bring into this space is something that was you know, happening, but still uh, not really happening in, in this very space of trends. So it was bringing big data technology and AI as a, as a way to, um, you know, uh, understand better uh, what are trends, what are changing behaviors, and so on and so forth. So, and, and Nextatus, by the way, is, uh, is uh, built on a very unique assumption and methodology. So it's, uh, it's based on the idea, and I'm going to the next slide, that there are you know, huge numbers, uh, there are a huge number of, of, in, of innovators around the world, and they, they are actually contributing a lot 
into the mainstream social media space. So, and if we, and we thought if we, if we had a way to uh, collect what they contribute and analyze that, we'd probably get a, a more uh, cleaner, let's say, view on what are the emerging trends at scale. So this is a, with the slide that I typically use with my daughter, she's a fan of Billie Eilish. But and so, um, what what she what she sees for the first time as a cool uh, fashion trend, for instance, has been already um, employed, originated by a number of unknown innovators uh, in social media, be it Tumblr, be it Reddit, be it Instagram, or whatever is the place in which these people are acting. And all this basically is uh you know it's crunched uh, by machines that are doing you know lots of uh uh different uh, analysis so it'd be be the bit textual or visual and and what we provide then to our clients we work mainly with global clients uh global brands and, and agencies um is this kind of automated reporting which is um again something different from the old-fashioned way to, of doing trend reports and trend forecasting. So it's it's more short form, it's real time, it's mainly visual, it's data backed, uh, meaning that what the other interesting part of our endeavor, I think, was that we wanted to find uh, this, like, let's say, mystical place between inspiration and uh, numbers. So it's, it's it's been always this kind of conflict between teams in, in, in brands like you know the creative directions and and and, all, and the number guys and the merchandise guys, uh, and and we wanted to have a place in which these teams can understand each other by looking into qualitative and creative and inspirational stuff, but backed with uh, with evidences. So this is Next Atlas, and and this is what we do uh, for a living. Uh, so, but the the, the point that I, I will make here. Uh, is basically a, a, a big, huge learning that we had by building uh, this kind of technology. So you know that, uh, so we, the data that we are using for, for our analysis, social media data. So from the major social media data that we all uh, use. But we, given that we, it's, it's a few years that we are doing this, we, we witnessed it, um, a, a strange, uh, we'd say, uh, phenomenon. So it, it has been, really the difference and the diversity and the visual diversity in this social media has been really declining uh, through the years. But this is kind of, a, of course, um, a, a very explainable in, in the sense that uh, when, when you, know, you get mainstream adoption of these kind of technologies, then you get mass uh, doing the stuff that typically mass does. So uh, uh, there's no, let's say, surprise in that. But still, it's, uh, it's a problem when you are using this kind of data uh, to provide interesting and insightful content and directions to your clients so this is what we this is, this is a, a, a you know a pure challenge that we we need to we need to address and so of course in the very beginning uh places like instagram were like super raw creativity and ideas uh but right now it's kind of different so this is a a fantastic project uh, that has been initiated by uh, this uh, artist. It's she's uh, Emma Agnes Schaeffer. I, I, I guess you you will you you know about that. So it's uh, it's called Insta Repeat, and Insta Repeat is basically um, you know the uh, illustration of how uh, we are basically all doing the same photographs on this kind of social media. So there's some kind of visual sameness everywhere. Uh, everyone is essentially making uh, the same the same photo time and again. Um, so this is actually you know I think that this it's in your, it's in your experience and it's it's interesting because all these visual stereotypes then are uh, channeled through uh, strategic insights. So brands are typically then feeding again into uh, this, this world with other stereotypes and is a huge cycle of sameness and this is actually uh bad so it's not it's not good it's not good in, in in two ways so it's it's not good because of course it's completely uninspiring you're doing the same thing that are, many people are doing and and then there are of course what i was mentioning before real world implications take a look at this one so uh when you are doing let's say take travel uh, as, as an example when you're doing uh, and repeating 
all these behaviors uh, and these visual stereotypes, they, they immediately translate in real world behaviors. This is a place in Norway, which you know, is, is suf it's suffering uh, from over tourism because uh, it's so popular as, a, as an Instagram spot that now it's, it's a problem. So this is actually, again, uh, a real world uh, sustainability uh, implication that you know, uh, comes from what I, I was uh, defining as a problem in the biodiversity of creative content. So you, you, I think you can see the implication here. And, and, and you know, whereas the, the, the problem before seemed like a very superficial, shallow, let's say first world uh, uh, problem, now you see that there are super uh, direct implication into, uh, into the environment, for instance. And it's not limited to the external environment. So uh, if you, for instance, take a look at how our interiors look like, uh, you know, lately, they are all the same. So if you, you just, this is actually my, my office. So it's kind of similar to the office you're seeing here, which is basically uh, one of the many places of we work around the world. So uh, homogeneity also in the interior design is what uh, this fantastic author called Kylie Cheka uh, has defined as airspace. So if you can read the, uh, the quote here, uh, it's like, we could call this strange geography created by technology airspace. It's the realm of coffee shops, bars, startup offices, and co-live workspaces that share the same hallmarks everywhere you go. A profusion of symbols of comfort and quality, at least to a certain connoisseur mindset. Minimalist furniture, craft beer, avocado toast, reclaimed wood, industrial lighting, cortados, and fast internet. And the point is that the homogeneity of these spaces means that traveling between them is completely frictionless. So it's you are basically everywhere in the same place. And of course, this is this this can be thought as a as a problem in terms of uh, again visual diversity. Um, sorry, oops. Here we are. But then, of course, we, we looked at the outdoor, we, we looked at the in, uh, indoor, and now just look at ourselves, at our bodies and our identities. This is another phenomenon on, on, on Instagram. It's a subculture of uh, lookalike uh, people. So there's, a, there's plenty of people, this is something I, you know, I was shocked to discover, <laughs> that try to look like celebrities in a very specific way, not just you know, uh, dressing with, like them, but actually modifying their bodies to look like, for instance, Kim Kardashian. So, and this phenomenon has been defined by Jaya Tolentino in a beautiful uh, New Yorker article, the Instagram face. So all the Instagram faces tend to look the same. Again, sameness all the way down. And by the way, this is a, a super dystopic in the, in the way that these Kardashian lookalikes then themselves become influencers. So they are actually, speeding up, you know, the, look, the lookalike subcultures. So it's like a vicious cycle that uh, sees uh, no, no end. So to recap these three steps, uh, outdoor, indoor, uh, you know, person and body, you look, you, you see that the visual sameness uh, has an impact, which is not that shallow. It's, it's about diversity, again, inclusivity, environment, and, and everything attached to all this concept, which is huge. But then if you think about the interaction uh, uh, you know, between social media and the world, this is what happens. So these are the key learnings. So the, the social media sameness might be, in a, in a, to a certain extent, inescapable, uh, because uh, of course, this is actually in the building blocks of our society uh, in our communities. Think uh, also TikTok challenges, which are, uh, this way of doing it again. Uh, the, everybody do the same things uh, on TikTok, and these are trends in a way. Uh, but of course, this this has it's not that you know it's bad per se, but because of course we we build society by by imitating each other and and creating bonds with each other. The problem is that the te technology typically. Um, you know, boost this kind of processes and 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 can be, can be you know. Um, excessive in a, in a certain sense. So, uh, and then there are algorithms that are designed also to foster homogeneity because if you want to see something, then you want to see again, 
it's almost the same thing. And this is, uh, again, a loop that is, uh, is, is driven by technology. But it, this is, uh, of course, a responsibility of the AI designers, uh, but still it's ingrained in, in our behaviors as, as people that are typically you know, taking comfort in, in, the, in the familiar and the, on the homogeneous. So this is, again, not really surprising. But this is a big, huge sameness bubble that humans have learned through, through the, you know, the centuries to, um, you know, to uh, break in, in, in ways that are you know, uh, with art, with technology. And I think that there's a space here to uh, deploy a technology that can help uh, you know, uh, break these kind of bubbles and sameness bubbles. So we need to really find ways to revive uh, these out of the ordinary, ordinary and rare occurrences that uh, might help us regenerate uh, the creative biodiversity that was original to the digital space. And, and as you will see, I think, and I hope you agree, uh, AI might, uh, might be of help. So this is a concept I'm really fond of lately. So all my team here, you know, it's complaining that I'm talking about this kind of concepts <laughs> constantly. Uh, and I, and I, you know, there's a. I think this is this is the 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 crucial concept that we have to discuss in the future uh, about you know the role of technology and also uh, of creativity. Um, so what we 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 experimented with was like playing with algorithm design to find ways to do exactly the opposite that typically machines are doing. So like finding needles uh, in the hay. So this is what we design, and I, I show you some examples because uh, we think this is my, this might be really game changing in some contexts. Take this photo. This is actually, you know, the uh, the stereotypical uh, outdoors, just like we we saw in the very first uh, discussion of our uh, sameness bubble. Uh, you know, the, the the this mountain photo, outdoor photo. Okay, this uh, um, rare uh, detection algorithm, rare reality, sorry, detection algorithm, is, uh, basically provides and gives a score to images that are, um, um, you know, or too common or very rare. So it, it, it has somehow learned to find what are the interesting, um, you know, uh, not standard visual formats. And, and basically it just gives like a, a score. So you can see here that the score here is very low in terms of rarity. So this is something uh, extremely common. And then there's, uh, if you see uh, uh, on top of the, the other chart is based on coolness score. So it's, it's built on top another, another, let's say, metric that is able to say, okay, uh, this kind of rarity or, or commonality can provide uh, some kind of engagement. So if you post this, then this is, this is kind of safe bet. It's not that quirky. It's not even a poor image. So this is actually predicting what are the reaction of uh, people looking at this kind of uh, uh, photo. This is for the, let's say, the outdoor uh, sameness uh, uh, that we saw before. And of course, this can be applied. Rarity detection in our in our AI is uh, completely agnostic to the, let's say, to the kind of content that is analyzing into the photo. So this is again airspace in, in its best, uh, let's say, rendition. And and you can see that the 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 the, the rarity is super low. Uh, actually, it's almost absent, and it's typically very safe to you know to provide this kind of visual because. It's common and it's you know it's it's cool in a very again um, innocuous uh, and innocent uh, way. There's nothing risky here in terms of creativity, and again, this is something that uh, basically proves what we are we are uh, seeing uh, in a in a very let's say qualitative way. This is just you know recognized at scale by machines. This is a, a, a bit more interesting because it's not really the typical Instagram face because of course there's like freckles and you know, this, this lady here uh, as a, you know, it's like in a different position uh, as, a, you know, as a normal uh, selfie. And so the rally score is a bit higher, but still it's not that rare. And it's again a safe bet because um, what you get here is something that is beautiful, is standardly beautiful, I would say. Uh, and, and there's no real, really quirkness there. The quirkiness, we, we define it as uh, something that it's 
very, very strange, but that provides a lot of engagement. So it's something that can be potentially viral in, 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 in the social media, let's say, lingo. And, and of course, in the end, there's something that is not that usual. So this algorithm is able to see a photo like this one and say, okay, this is kind of weird. So it's super rare. I didn't see that <laughs> you know, before. And, and by the way, it's super quirky because there's something strange there. And the sheer composition of pixels there, you know, looks like very original. Uh, it, it doesn't, to, you know, you, there's a, no, no judgment of, uh, let's say, beauty behind these algorithms. It, there's a, there's, it can be really rare and quirky, but can be still beautiful or not beautiful, in, in, let's say, in the, if we judge it, let's say, from a static, an aesthetical point of view. But the point here is that this is really unseen. Uh, you don't typically see in your feed, I bet, uh, many photos of, uh, of this kind. And so this is for the rarity algorithms. Um, so we at, at, at Nexaslas, we have studied the world of modern social media since its inception, basically. And over the years, we have uh, accumulated a constellation of insights into the factors which give birth to global trends. And this data has given us the impetus to create a way to measure the originality and innovation of social media content. This is what you, you know, saw uh, in the, in the, uh, uh, until now. So in a sea of online content, what makes humans connect and engage with each other stories? This is the question that we basically devised to answer. And when we tried to answer this question, we, we wanted to design something that discovers social media posts which break free from the traditional canons of visual formats. And so going back to the methodology uh, uh, you know, with which we uh, mm, you know, merge technology with trend forecasting uh, methodologies that are more let's say, traditional, we use the reality algorithm also to discover interesting profiles because the assumption again here is that if they contain the seeds of originality, they probably contain the seeds of my, what might be a future uh, trend. So, and then the, let's say the final, uh, uh, the other uh, uh, buzzword that is super discussed right now in sustainability, and it's about giving back to the space and, and the planet in this case uh, that we are uh, consuming on the other way. And this is actually applies again in the, in the very in a very similar way to the digital space. So uh, interestingly, we can uh, help generate difference at scale, as, as I was uh, defining it, by using AI. So we can provide more creativity instead of less, and more difference instead of homogeneity. And how we do that? Well, for instance, again, we experimented with a number of technologies. So this, uh, this is, again, a, a, bit, a bit of showcase of what we do. Um, you might have heard about uh, generative design, which is a way to um, you know, feed a, a huge amount of data to a machine, a neural net, and, and have, have it basically being creative on top, so as an output. Um, with many poss possible configuration and scenarios in terms of design. Uh, we experimented that with, with uh, for instance, trend reports. So we, we fed uh, uh, literally tens of thousands of trend reports to uh, a GPT-2 text generation machine. And we now have like what we call the trend writer. So it's basically automating uh, the, the creative process when we uh, you know, write trend reports. So it basically, it just provides a number of possible uh, uh, trend reports based on a prompt and uh, of the beginning of a text. So, and, and the, the interesting fact is that this kind of technology are super uh, able to uh, be on topic and even be as specific as you know uh, addressing certain subtopics such as let's say vaccines or uh, holidays. Um, and the, 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 the other interesting part is that you can tune this kind of technology to be extreme conser extremely conservative in what they invent or extremely creative. So they can be, uh, you know, super far-fetched in what they devise. Um, so would, our, our understanding of this kind of technology is not just to let them do creative randomness because it might be 
you know, useful from an inspirational point of view, but then might be uh, extremely useless when you have to apply it into a real business. And given that we have real world data, we, we also think that the direction here would be to constrain the creation with, 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 with real world data. And this is what you will see next. If, you, if we move from text uh, to the visual space and to images, uh, then this is actually already happening some, somehow. Uh, so uh, you might have heard about an artist called Robbie Barra. Uh, he has done a beautiful uh, work with Acne Studios uh, a, a couple of years ago, and he's already experimenting with AI-created uh, styles and patterns. And But again, he was using mainly some random creativity at work. Uh, and then you get basically AI trying to imitate in a very creative way the designs of that designer. Um, what we are looking at is kind of different and we want to experiment with instilling knowledge of trends that we have in data into the creativity uh, uh, in this kinds of fashion styles. So this is actually uh, constrained. By the way, and this can be made uh, at large scale. So the other interesting point of technology is that it's an augmentation of the creative choice. So it's really helping finding, uh, you know, something that is not really, uh, for computational reasons, uh, at, uh, at end uh, for creatives um, at the moment. This is not uh, only about fashion, this is also about interior design. So we, we have uh, style detection for interior design, so as we have it for fashion, we have it for like materials, uh, we have it for um, patterns and, and, and styles, as I was saying. And again, this is, you know, you just let a machine recognize and, and, and look into the existing trends in uh, data like the one that Staclas is working on and basically uh, feed this kind of real world data into creative machines that are able to find and produce trend that do not exist. So this is actually what I was, uh, actually um, was my first idea for this talk. You might have heard about uh, many websites doing this, this person does not exist, or uh, there was another, uh, what was it one about Airbnb, this Airbnb does not exist. So they were like deep faking um, um, things uh, uh, at large scale. But the, the point is if you, if you want to make them this kind of technology, some kind of applicable and useful, uh, they they should be tamed a bit with uh, with real world data, and and this is what we uh, think it would be useful to do in the near future. So these are actually my final takeaways. I hope I'm in time. Um, so the the main point is that preserving creative uh, biodiversity is really crucial, not only to foster originality and to, co to contrast, let's say, aesthetic gentrification in the form of Instagram face, airspace, and cultural homogenization. But as you saw, then there's a, you know, this is directly linked to in real life sustainability issues like uh, over tourism or unsustainable consumerism or even plastic surgery for body modification. Um, uh, to match uh, some kind of ideal of beauty. And so these are real world implications that are, uh, you know, passing from uh, something that was aesthetic in, in the first place. And of course, there's an implication for brands here, uh, which is the urgency of addressing this kind of tension between the need to preserving rarity and niches and and the other, on the other way, and on the other, and, you know, on the other hand, feeding the global monoculture that they are, you know, they they, they are used to, to to feed. So this is kind of a, a big change of mindset, and this is also uh, very special to the digital space, but not only. Finally, this is what I I will I guess launch as a point of discussion uh, for our Q and A uh, AI is of course can be thought of as a part of the problem uh, when you look at the recommendation algorithms that we are um, uh, using all the times, but if designed in the right way can be really part of the solution. And because you can, as you, can, you, as you saw, you can, you can design it to actually nurture and discern variety in the creative unseen. 
and this is really what we we are you know this is this this is in our DNA as a, as a tech company as we we wanted to find the interesting people the interesting trends the interesting things and the creative things and 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 so we are completely against this kind of homogenization and by the way this is a this super interesting that you uh, and this is why also I felt urgent this kind of uh, discourse because it's happening right now as we speak uh, a huge a huge revolution that we I think we will understand in the next few years but the relation between digital and rarity or scarcity is changing completely with what is called uh, NFT NFTs I don't know if you know you you know what it means but these are non fungible tokens this is a ways of uh, inscribing, let's say, uh, rarity into a digital object, which is replicable. So this is kind of uh, having a cake and eating, and eating too. Uh, this is the, the a strange hybrid in which uh, scarcity and, and, and abundance are to stay together. So this is, apart from what we were seeing about sameness and originality, this is the, the problem with rarity and and scarcity in the digital space is the problem of the next few years. And I think I'm done and hope uh, you enjoy it. Thank you. Thank you.